All right, I think we're all set. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Assalamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbi shrahi sadri wa yasri li amri. Wa ahlil uqtata min lisani yafu qawdi rabbi zindi ilma. We we'll begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then peace and blessings upon our final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, welcome back everyone to our Tuesday night uh, uh, gathering in which it's unpacking our stories, trying to understand some wisdoms behind Surah Yusuf and understand what the best of stories in the Quran really has to offer for all of us. And today what we're really going to focus on is the, as we have been every week, is uh, understanding that the narrative Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures is not just a narrative that occurred historically, but is a narrative that's literally unfolding in hundreds of millions of uh, living rooms across the world, that it never actually stopped. And we're really going to be seeing the psychology of a lot of what uh, occurs in Surah Yusuf happening in maybe in our own families um, and trying to understand some lessons from it. So... With that, the last couple of weeks, what we've been through is we've been through ayat 1 through 14, and we broke that up into three parts. We had 1 through 3 in the first section, then the second, uh, or an introduction to the su surah in the first session, second one, 1 through 3, I believe, and then we went, no, actually, no, we did 1 through 3, 4 through 6, and then last week was the longest, was 7 through 14. And we've had a couple of scenes painted for us already. And those scenes where we had a father talking with his young child, or let me rephrase that how the Quran does, a young child talking to his father. And that beautiful conversation that they have in which the, uh, the father was able to really give the child um, uh, confidence in understanding, no, this is something really beautiful that's happening to you. You're gonna live the legacy of your ancestors and uh, uh, Yaqub, Ibrahim, uh, Ishaq, you're going to relive their, their ancestry and tells them what to do very in, in the immediate future, which is your brothers. Don't tell them because they might have a plot against you. We had that beautiful conversation. Then we shifted last week into, um, I have no other way of calling it, but an ugly conversation that the brothers, when they had a problem too. Yusuf Alayhi had a problem, so he went to his father. And I think there was already a huge lesson for us to take away is especially when you're feeling uneasy, you should go talk to someone who's going to make you calm. That's what Yusuf does when he talks to his father. The brothers, what do they do? They are feeling uneasy. They're not feeling loved. Instead of going to the person who could address their issue, which would have been their father, they talk to each other. And they are the worst possible people you could be talking to because a takes them towards the worst possible direction, which is what uh, we talked about mob mentality last week, kill them. Um, and eventually that's the third conversation in the story. The story just seems to be just conversations over and over again. Today, we're gonna get out of the conversation mode. But the third conversation was they wear down their father and say, you never trusted us. They do like emotional blackmail. You never trust us. You never let Yusuf go with us. Can't you see we just want good for him? We had that take place. And the last thing that we ended up with is, um, that uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, um, captured is, what did they say at the very end? Um, if a wolf was to devour him, despite our uh, strong group, that's one way of translating it. There's another way of translating it too. A wolf devouring him when we're here, it's almost like you don't need the wolf, we're here. I say that on purpose, inna idhan lakhasirun. If that happened, we're definitely, we would be the ones who were the utmost losers in this situation. Because where a lot of the story is gonna deal with subtle communication, not just normal communication, but what's the true intent behind the speech that comes across in the subtle uh, text. Um, we would say in speech, this is like nonverbal communication, but even in verbal communication, the word choice that was used, the order of the words that were used, What's actually being said? Yusuf Al-Islam's talent is going to be what? He can decode speech no, no, better than anyone else. We're going to start finding that also this week. Um, that, that's one of the major lessons that's to be found. That's where we left off. Is even Allah even drops that hint already. They said, why do you need a wolf when we're here? And Allah then continues on with the story today. We're going to try to get through ayat 15 through 20. So six ayat. Um, and in today's lesson, there's going to be a lot of conversations on continuing the idea of wearing down someone, how plots work, how false narratives can be called out. Again, more emotional manipulation that the brothers will try to do to Yusuf, uh, to Yaqub alayhi salam. 
Uh, and then we're, uh, so we're going to talk about some of that, the psychology of kind of presenting yourself as a protagonist and justifying worst actions. That'll be another point of conversation. And uh, the other part that I really want to have spend some time on is the response of Yaqub, which I think many of us get wrong. We think like being prophetic means being stoic, because what's the famous line? Fasabarun jamil, beautiful patience. I want to unpack that a little bit in terms of like, what does patience in a given situation actually mean? And what, in my opinion, what, not just my opinion, but what can we take away from the idea of him responding with patience? Was it just him saying at that moment, patience, I am being patient. No, I, I think it's a lot more nuanced, a lot more human uh, than just that. So with that, I'm going to, um, uh, this week, that's the summary of the story. Instead of reciting the whole thing, we're going to go through it ayah by ayah. That's the summary of what we're going to be discussing. Um, and now let's unpack it, inshallah, ayah by ayah. We'll start with ayah number um, 15, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ And then finally, when they took him. There's many different words in Arabic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could use for when something like uh, follows something else. And falamma is by far the longest uh, way of saying after a certain time this happened. Uh, because you could say wa idha, famata. There'd be many other ways of saying this, but Allah says falamma and finally is uh, the, the best probably translation there. And finally, dhahabu, they took him. They took him far away. Dhahabu seems to suggest they went. Uh, meaning that it was it wasn't just really close by. They went as really pretty far away from the house. Bihi wa ajma'u. They went away with him, and then they gathered once more. And aj'aluhu fi ghayabat al jubb, al And they took him away, and they gathered once again to throw him to the bottom of the well. I want to stop here for just a second. Remember, the way we understand the story of Yusuf is every detail Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives is has a lesson in it. Because this was a story that when revealed to the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, and the Arabs didn't know anything about it. But this surah wasn't just revealed to them. It was also revealed for the people who asked him, which is what? The Bani Israel in Mecca, they wanted to use this as a test. Why did the Bani Israel end up in uh, Egypt? That was a test that they have. And Surah Yusuf comes as a response to that. It was something to clarify, not just the Muslims give them lessons in the Prophet is in the year of sadness, so he's going to hear about this epic tale of overcoming all odds, but also is they have a story and our story is supposed to correct their story. So every detail that's given actually has that quality that's associated with it. I haven't really been focusing on this all that much, but the, the Christian and Jewish narratives of this are actually paint Yusuf and Yaqub in a very different light. They paint Yusuf as this like naive kid who goes and tells his brothers about his dream. And they paint Yaqub as also a very kind of like um, a, a father who made a lot of mistakes by giving more attention to one child than the other and like favoring children. The Quran doesn't do that because that seems to suggest, no, we're giving you a corrected narrative. There's some parts that you have which are correct, but there's other parts of it that need correction. And this is the correction. So by adding certain details and omitting certain details, when you omit a detail, that also seems to suggest that that wasn't important. You guys focused on something that wasn't necessary. But Allah captures, and they went and they decided to uh, um, throw him to the bottom of the well. They gathered once more. Why does it say they gathered once more? It almost seems like, I'm going to talk about this from a, uh, today there's going to be a lot of psychology um, and the psychology of kind of justifying actions. Um, some of you have probably heard the, um, the like, I believe it's a quote from Huckleberry Finn, which is something along the lines of uh, the, uh, someone who tells the truth never has to remember what they said, right? And why is that? Because like, it's the truth. You don't have to remember it. It's just like exactly as it happened. That's, that's all you need. Who needs to constantly figure out what they said or keep in mind what they said? Someone who's not telling the truth, someone who's, decept uh, who's, who's planning for deception, right? For me, why would, Allah already said they gathered and they came up with a plot. But when they came together, finally, they all had to gather once more. It's like, hey, what are we doing again? Which one do we decide on? Because that's the na nature of when you're doing things full of deception and doing things that are like a plot. You can't just say everyone knows what they're doing, right? No, it's let's let's meet up again. What are we what are we doing? Oh, yeah, we, we decided not to kill him, right? We decided to throw him in the well. Well, whose job is what? Like, they have to figure all of that out. And that typically is something that seems to suggest that they weren't all on the same page. And they find they gathered all together uh, again. 
يَجْعَلُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْدِ um, And uh, they put him um, uh, فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْدِ In the darkest parts. The غَيَاب is literally the part of the well that someone goes to where you can't see them anymore. You can't hear them anymore. In the deepest part of the well. Like غَيَاب is something that's unseen. So they put him so deep in the well that you couldn't even see him. Um, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I, Before we even actually get there um, This is a pretty graphic scene when you think about it, like think about what's happening. You have 10 relatively adult children taking a seven or eight year old, maximum nine year old. And the way it's described is they all take him, they gather together and they're even confronting amongst each other. Hey, what do we do next? And what I mean by that is like, they're talking, did we decide to kill him or did we decide to throw him down the well? No, we decided to throw him down the well, hold his arms, hold like, it's a violent scene and he's hearing all of this happening. It's not like they're doing this in, uh, in far away while he's right there. He's hearing all this happening. Imagine how scarring that is for a child to like see your own brothers who are supposed to be like your caretakers plotting and then throwing you down a well. That's worse than just throwing you down a well. They also plotted in front of him too. And Allah Subhanahu then says, ilayhi. And Allah inspired to Yusuf or said to Yusuf, um, that one day you will remind them of their deeds and while they won't be aware. A lot of things happening here. One is this is traumatizing for Yusuf alayhi salam. So Allah gives him some sort of comfort. There's many different interpretations in terms of what's happening. And one of them is that Allah sent angel Jibreel, uh, Gabriel, to go down and literally talk to Yusuf and tell him it's going to be all right. One day you're going to tell them, put every detail that they did in front of you, you're going to tell them all of it and they don't know. That's one part. Another way of looking at it is be amri him. One day you'll understand this affair and they aren't aware of it right now. They're not aware of what they're doing. One day you will be the one to inform them what they're actually doing. There's many ways of really looking at this. I also see this as when Allah says, oh, hey, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was an angel that was sent. This could be Yusuf, السلام, even thinking back to the um, uh, what his father said. Remember his father says, uh, uh, yajtabika, that your Lord has chosen you. It's like, oh yeah, Allah told me this would happen, that I would be going down the same legacy of my father, Abraham. Abraham was thrown into something as well. What is Ibrahim and Islam thrown into? He was thrown into a fire, right? And what did Allah send uh, to Ibrahim when he was thrown into a fire? Didn't he send an angel that said what? If you want, I can get you out of this right now. And Ibrahim says, no, I won't. Allah is the one um, who, who's going to get me out of the situation. I see the parallel here. His father had told him, you're like the legacy of Ibrahim. Part of what I see this happening is Yusuf is getting the exact same thing. He was thrown in a fire. He's being thrown in water, in a well. He's like, and an angel is being sent to him saying, you're going to be able to inform them of what happened. Lots of interesting parallels to be had. One of the things, um, and I, I hate to use almost like a George Lucas reference here, but one of the uh, um, interesting uh, facts about the stories of the prophets in general or the story of humanity is it seems to rhyme. The same things happen over and over again. Uh, Ibrahim's people throw him in a fire. Yusuf's brothers throw him into a well. Musa alayhi salam, is driven out of his homeland to go to Fir'aun, away from his home in Fir'aun, right? There, it's the same thing happening. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi will be kicked out of Mecca, go to Medina. The same thing happens over and over again. It's almost as if the archetype of what builds amazing characters is the same. And that's really what's happening here. By Abu Tarjub, they're being thrown. And Allah then inspires him once again, that you're going to be able to tell them of all of this. Another way I actually, uh, um, and I'm curious to see what are some reflections you guys have? I kind of thought of the, con like you mentioned that this concept of being displaced, right? You're displaced from your home, you're displaced from your family, you're displaced from the thing that is essentially supposed to provide the most comfort and stability to you. And I don't know why this is my first thought, but I kind of thought of the homeless right and most of us it is on on one side it's something to look at and you appreciate the fact that you are not homeless 
but from another perspective, it could be seen as like this could be the making of someone who's being tested in a way that the prophets were tested, right? Um, uh, if some, if we look at someone who's lost their parents, we would draw the parallel to the Prophet Sallallahu right? And it builds a sort of character that resembles to the prophets if of course you look at it the right way and you think about it a certain way and i i'm in no place to like say because i've never been in that position but that is what i thought of that if i'm in a position i should not be looking down upon someone who is homeless or who is in that kind of a situation because i don't know what kind of character they're they're building as a result of it not a lot i think i think that's a, that's a pretty astute observation that yeah you don't know that like if someone wants to see this broken family right now, they'd look at it and be like, oh my gosh, what did their father do? Oh my gosh, how is this happening? But, and this is, I think part of what's being even said here, you'll be able to inform what was actually happening while they weren't aware. You know, something interesting, uh, this boy is going to be the one who saves Egypt. Like, would anyone watching this scene happen say, this is going to be the savior of Egypt right there? And Egypt isn't a superpower just yet. Because of Yusuf Islam, Egypt will become the regional superpower. Why? Because they're going to be the only ones who can survive the drought that's about to come. This is the savior of Egypt. You all just don't know. Yeah, so when we see people going through their trials, we have no idea how, like, what Allah's plan actually is for them. That's so true. It's interesting because especially like in Desi culture, like in Pakistan, there's like hierarchies so like it's like um if you like ever like visit box and it's like you know people are literally ranked by how rich they are so it doesn't matter who you are if you're wealthy or at the top if you're poor or at the bottom so the wealthy you know they automatically get a lot of like respect and influence and wherever they go they can get their way around while like the poor like the nokranis or like you know like the beggars like it's so easy for people to just like yell at them or like tell them off or you know just like just you know just basically cut them off and treat them almost as if they're not even human just because of where their financial standing is yeah, um, yeah no subhanallah and that that's terrible and that's the opposite of what the quran tries to uh, to put for us is um and one of the things i love i i, I know i brought this parallel up before but this parallels well with the story of musa de salam musa de salam starts in the castle like in the house of pharaoh and he ends up being a farmer yusuf de salam starts as a farmer turns into a slave and then we'll end up being in the castle. So like, you have no idea what people who are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what, it, it, what, like, what their path is going to be. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, why is it important that, um, uh, that they, that, that um, why, why is it important that they are unaware? Like, what, why is it important that they don't know who he is? I see that in two or three different ways. Um, and the one is, this is Jibri, Allah SWT inspiring Yusuf Islam that they don't know what they're doing. Kind of like their father. Remember what their father said? He said, your brothers are going to plot a plot against you, but shaitan is a clear enemy. Wahum la yash'urun is actually talking about the brothers. They don't actually, it's not saying they will not know who you are. They're saying they don't know who, what, they, or what they're doing right now. Mm. Like, and the other idea is you're going to tell them about their plan and you're even going to tell them if it hadn't been for you guys throwing me in the well, what did they want for Yusuf alayhi salam? They want him to be forgotten. But by them doing this, he becomes the most memorable person in Egypt. So this is the whole, this whole idea of like, Allah, you will tell them about what their plan actually was because Allah, it was actually Allah's plan that they were enacting, not their own they're unaware of even what their role in all of this is. I see. I hope that makes sense. Because, I mean, no, that makes sense. And but uh, I guess the more, the more like, the, the most, I think that the meaning that comes to most people's minds is the fact that they literally didn't know who he was at the end of the story. Yeah. So I was wondering why it was, that was important. That, that'll be there as well. And I think it adds to the literary surprise, <laughs> right? You, you just think about like, Man, they, they didn't they didn't know who he was the whole time, um, and it's it's like that huge shock value that takes place. I think that's there, but I, I find it I find the deeper meaning to be uh, um, even more of like this is still Allah is, Allah saves the brothers, right? The brothers Allah didn't talk about this story and said it was just in the story of Yusuf 
that you have lessons. No, Allah said in the story of Yusuf and his brothers, there are signs. Mm -hmm. So his brothers are also painted in this light that they just got overcome with the jealousy. They got overcome with these negative things. Okay, thank I you. have a question. Oh, sorry, go oh. ahead. Oh, no, you go, you go. I was just going to say, firstly, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Second of all, I was going to say that this just kind of reminds me of how when they're putting him, when they're throwing him into the well, they look down upon him. But then on that day, when they're reminded of their deed and they're making sujood, you're basically looking up to Yusuf alayhi sunam at that point. So I uh, think it's, sorry, what? Well, I was, I'm just, wow, that's, that's pretty profound. That's yeah, really so, and I think that basically also perpetuates this idea of humility that was mentioned before. And I think had they thought of putting themselves in Yusuf Salam's shoes, and if they understood how much Yusuf Salam loved them and saw them as these stars in his life, then perhaps they would have been more uh, aware of their position and value and reconsidered their actions and not have chosen to, you know, gone down that route or engaged in that course of action but um i think this just kind of shows us when we're just so self-absorbed what can what can really happen eventually yeah so not a lot i think that's a that's a, that's a it's a very profound way of looking at it is they're unaware and part of it is they're unaware of everything even what you think of them um yeah so well that's that's actually I, I hadn't thought about that i really appreciate that i have a question mm -hmm. Um, them, the brothers not knowing, right? Sometimes uh, I, this is a very common um, quote or phrase. Like you can tell a lot about a person's character based on how they treat someone without a title, right? So is, could, could that be part of it? Like when you know someone's role, when you know someone's significance, so to speak, of course, when, um, like when you know someone's role and significance, it's hard to tell, even sometimes within your own self, whether your actions or behaviors are genuine, mm -hmm. right? So it would be easier to show the parallels in their behaviors and understanding why they behave the way they did if they don't know the title versus when they do. That's just what I'm thinking about. Because me personally, I know that I have to work hard to keep my intention in check in general. But if I am informed about someone's title, I have to really sit back and think, oh, am I helping this person because they're important according to society? Or am I helping this person because they're important to Allah? Like I have to sit there and I have to make sure that my original intent before knowing their title is the same as my intent after their title. So is there like a, I don't know, that's just something that I thought of that could be a possibility for them also not knowing for the brother that asked earlier. That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I, I can see it that they're unaware of who you are. That's how it's typically translated. Um, of, of your title so that's why they're treating you in this way and I think there is an, uh, a conversation to be had of like you're actually experiencing them as they are this could be even Yusuf Aysam finally being aware of who his brothers are because like we said before he saw his brothers as stars right we have no reason to think he had an animosity towards them and now you're being made aware and they're the ones who are unaware yeah I, I can see a part of that I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, you mentioned the trauma like of being a kid and thrown into a hole. And it made me think of how some of the best and worst people I know have went through some really traumatic event when they were younger. And so the discrepancy between this account and the one that I grew up with uh, makes me wonder, like for those that come out as good people, were they good before the trauma and that's what left them as good people or was it like they were refined by that <laughs> um so i i think i think that's a very good question um i i think it's it's another way of phrasing the nature versus nurture debate right <laughs> did the trauma change them into the amazing person they were or did the trauma just make it slightly better or like make it come out what was already kind of innately within them um i 
I'm gonna say here, one way that we as a society try to handle that is in like comic book culture of like, is it trauma that made someone a superhero? Or was it, and sometimes oftentimes that is, it's the thing that gave them their powers or other times what is it? That's the thing that gave them their resolve but they were already good to begin with. Like we, we ask that same question all the time in, in popular culture. And I think the same thing can be said here is do we say Yusuf Al-Aysan was amazing? That's why the uh, trauma didn't affect him. Or do we say, actually no, the trauma made him. I, I don't know that there's an answer to that. It's the actual, the answer is probably both. <laughs> right? Like there's an idea, Yusuf Al-Islam specifically, the word that's used for him is ijtiba'a. Ijtiba'a is the idea of you got chosen for your unique qualities, meaning you already had the qualities. Istifa is the other term. And istifa is the term of like Allah chooses whomever Allah wills because Allah knows you, uh, that you will be made into something amazing. So I, I, I think both of those answers exist. Um, Since uh since the other since the brothers threw him into something into the hole and they were and this becomes kind of how he gets to egypt how culpable are the brothers in what they did like i'm not trying to excuse throwing a child into a well but it seems like this was maybe not necessary but it seemed to be involved yeah so i would i would make the argument that it was necessary right but it doesn't mean that it was a good act god can work through ways and basically if they're they should be punished there should be a trial that takes place and this was an evil act no one is going to question that but god can transform an evil act into a good act so the brothers do get the harm of the act it's not like, oh, well, it all works out anyway. So this was good to begin with. No, that, that, that you're not allowed to do that because you're not God at the end of, uh, uh, of it. Like you're responsible based on your capability and your understanding of the situation at hand. And we're actually going to see that as the response uh, of uh, Jacob in just a little bit. When Jacob responds, he'll use that same exact principle at play. Will be, I'm responsible for what? My reaction right now, you're responsible for what you did. So it'll 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 be what we're gonna we're gonna see that play out i saw a couple of comments on the chat i'm just gonna yeah definitely i would agree Estar, that um uh, what, what you said makes a lot of sense and based on what he deems is necessary to make you better that's the trial that one will be afflicted with some trials bring out the uh uh the better in the person being tested while others trials would change the person being tested yeah definitely i think that that makes a lot of sense um I'm gonna continue through, we're at 6.30. I'm gonna try my best to finish by like seven, 10 or so for today. And we have uh, um, five more ayat. Uh, the next um, ayat, Allah SWT says, وَجَاءُوا أَبَاهُمْ أَن I actually find it really interesting. This is a very short ayat. And Allah uses this to mean to be one whole. An ayat at the end of the day has an entire lesson based within it. Um, and they returned to their father in the evening crying. In the story itself, what did they just do? They didn't did a terrible act. They just threw their brother into a well. And they went, they returned in the evening. That's an important detail. They threw him in the morning, in daylight. And then they waited until the evening to get there. Why did they wait till the evening? Because his father is not going to go out in the middle of the night to go looking for him. If they went out in the middle of the woods or like in random fields, you can't search for anyone at night. So this was planned out and they went crying and they waited for a while. Why did they wait for a while? Again, this was plot, a, a plot point of they're like, if we go back right now, what is he going to say? Go look for him. I'll come with you. No, we have to go at night so that there's, there's no possibility of that happening. There's, there's intelligence that they have, evil intelligence, but there is intelligence that they have um, going into this. So they do that, waja is used, and way later they return um, in the evening, yabkun, and they're crying. And um, the other thing is they're crying. That seems to be a detail to add in there that uh, um, I personally think the reason Allah would mention that as a detail is uh, it, they, they, they really plan the scene out. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna cry. I almost feel like they all like gather together. It's like, dude, how do we cry? And one of them's like, pluck, pluck your nose hairs. And then they're like, yeah, that's that's a way to get the tears flowing. Like it's a fake cry. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is um, they might've actually been legitimately crying. 
apply because even if someone does something evil, like their humanity might come out. Oh my gosh, what did we do? But they're going to use those tears for something terrible. We're going to really try to understand false narratives today because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spends two ayat really talking about this. But that's when they go to their father in the evening crying. That we sometimes think tears are what? Tears are pure. Anyone who cries, we should believe them right away. But this is a clear-cut example in the Quran where like, no, no, no. Just because someone's crying doesn't mean they're truthful. There can be such thing as deceptive tears. Um, this is going to be a, a controversial and non-politically correct uh, uh, thing to say because um, we oftentimes are in a, an age of feelings where like your feelings are more important than anything else. And how we judge that is if someone seems emotional about it, someone might do something terrible and then they post a YouTube video with piano music and some tears. And they're like, I'm really sorry. I'll donate to this anti-suicide group or something. I'm specifically referencing one thing that happened on YouTube maybe two years ago. Um, but and then everyone's like, look, he looks so sincere. We should we should all be like praising him now and not condemning the act that he did. Like that's what tears. Um, thank you for those of you that are private messaging me the the name of the individual. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but it it's suddenly turns into this whole thing of like um, tears mean they must be genuine in some way, but they don't. It's really captured here of like, people can fake tears. You can't just fall for it every single time. Um, so does that feel hard for those of you that are confirming this? So hail always good to have you on. <laughs> um, and if anything, they become more popular at the end of it too, right? Sorry, I'm not bitter at all <laughs> about this happening over and over again. Um, when people do dumb stuff and we're just like, oh, because they seem sincere. No, you, people can fake sincerity. Um, Sorry, now my rant is over. Anyone else have any other reflections on ayah number 16? I also think it's a really slow ayah. There's a lot of, of mud in it. And when I was reading that, at first I thought that Prophet Yaqub was really waiting for them to come home. But then it's from the perspective of the brothers. So I feel like for them as well, this time was really long. Yeah, and that's actually uh, uh, interesting that you say that. That's one of the reasons why we, or the, we say the recitation itself has um, uh, elements of the story within it. There are three major muds here, which seem to suggest that this took a while to happen. Like the recitation is tafsir too. So that's a good point, Adina. I think it's interesting that they came, like you pointed out that they, they took a long time and they did it in the evening. Because a couple of ago, he they're like, if we remove Yusuf alayhi salam, then our father will be free to pay attention to us. But like what parent, it seems that they know, like what parent upon losing their child feels free? Yeah. Um, I also thought it was kind of interesting that they waited until the evening to I guess that indicates that it will show Yaqub Salam that they actually looked for um, Yusuf Salam, that like, you know, they pretended to look for Yusuf Salam so Yaqub Salam would not be suspicious as much. But. To me, this is actually one of those details of the story that pro is a dead giveaway that they planned it. And why? Because some of you have probably, I, I do, <laughs> To sound weird, but I've, I've been like a camp counselor before and uh, uh, specifically like YM camp. And when people pull pranks, when they make a story of like, when you know they're lying is when the details work out. When like, oh, conveniently you came in the evening. No one could have come sooner. Like, there, it's not like there's 10 of you. So you couldn't send one person to tell me what's going on and the nine of you look. No, you all just happen to come in the evening? Ha, huh, that's convenient. You see my point? Like, it lines up too perfectly. There isn't the human chaos of an actual situation when there's a crisis that takes place. So to me, this would end up being, and again, maybe it's just someone who, who I've heard too many stories of people like um, pretending to do things or giving me false narratives, though you can start poking holes in it very, very quickly. And especially when things work out, when there seems to be like a flawless execution, like everything was logical, suddenly it's like, that's a problem because that's not how the world works. 
it's not imperfect logic. What would actually happen in a time of crisis is one person would think, let's go to our father. Maybe he has a good idea. One person would go here. One person would go here. No, they all went at the same time. Huh, that's weird. And they all came together crying. That's weirder. You mean some of you aren't still out there looking? No, all of us decided to come at the same time. Oh, <laughs> there's so much about that that doesn't make any, that, that seems too perfect. That makes it a problem. I'm starting to have a growing appreciation for this ayah because initially it may just seem something that's just added as an unnecessary detail. But when I read this ayah, I immediately narrowed down on the word weeping. And I think that just places emphasis on the emotional manipulation that is transpiring here. And I think that really just shows that Islam takes logic, rationale, and emotions all very seriously. But that, you know, regardless of your age or your gender, because clearly here the guys, they're the brothers, they're not super old either. So, but despite that, they're using this form of emotional manipulation to, you know, kind of just show their dad, oh, you know, we're really sad that he's already said something happened to him as well, or, you know, something of that sort. But it's just really interesting how even at that age, they're using emotional manipulation when we kind of begin to see these traits well we assume these traits develop in people later on but they're very young here you know what i mean yeah it's really interesting no definitely definitely isn't that scary that your own child like i can only imagine as a parent if you just like when you realize your child has discovered lying for example my mom told me i would I would lie about little things when I was like three or four. I would just stare at her, but it was so obvious that I was lying because my face would change and I would look at her and I would have this guilty conscience and then I would last maybe five minutes and then I'd start crying. But it, like when you realize your child has discovered lying, there's, an all, there's a new level of alertness within a parent. Yeah. So when you discover that your child is actually trying to emotionally manipulate you into believing something that you know isn't true I can imagine that adds a whole new level of pain to the situation yeah yeah no I agree um as someone who has a four-year-old who is just about <laughs> we, ha we had the first lie a couple of uh weeks ago where we asked did you eat the food and like yes and then there was like this like look to the left and she's directly looked at the trash can <laughs> we go over and open it. it's like hmm <laughs> okay so this is the thing now um and then she felt so bad about it like right away but it was such a giveaway or a yes and then where did her eyes dart to like, I hope they don't look there. <laughs> and that's exactly what, um, so it, it, it I, and that exact same thing was kind of happening. We're like, this is the first time we've seen it. Oh my gosh. And it was, it was just easy to see. And I, I thought about this as well. I'm like, no, this could be taken to an nth level. This is an innocent type of thing. It was just like, um, when, and what they're trying to do is actually good. Like when I really think about what my daughter did is like, we kept coming by and saying, are you done with your food? And we kept, she said, kept saying no. And we seemed sad. So all, all they want is the food to go away. So are you done with your food? And then the first lie came out. It was just funny to see that, that, that take place in real time. Um, this is just like a side story, but the one thing that my mom always, it's like one of her fondest memories, I think, is she caught me playing with marbles when I was young. And she had like a little reaction. She was like, oh my God. And, and I saw her face and I got scared. So she's standing right in front of me, but I wanted to get rid of it. So I put them in my mouth and I just, I put them in my mouth and I stared at her like, oh, I don't have them in my hand anymore. So she can't get upset, but that made it worse. <laughs> and she, to this day, she laughs about it. She was like, your logic was so, you thought I would just, I don't know, but it's one of those things where you try to hide it because you don't want, like you said, you don't want your parent to be upset. It's to make sure it's to spare them. It's like a form of mercy within a child. That's actually, uh, that thought I'm going to continue with the next ayah because it's very applicable right here. Allah captures in the next ayah, قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَا, O our father, إِنَّا ذَهَبَنَا, 
nastabiqu tarakna Yusuf. Like we were racing with each other and we left Yusuf in the mata'ina with our stuff. Fa'akalahu dhi'bu and a wolf ate him. Wama anta bi mu'minin lana. That's going to be important. And you won't give in to our belief. That's how I'm going to translate it. Even if we were telling the truth. So I'm going to actually capture that. Um, actually, hold that thought for a little bit because when Yaqub responds, uh, we're going to actually under, have that understanding be there. Where Yaqub won't blame them, he will say, your greed has caused you to do something. Or someone has caused you to do something and you fell for it. So he doesn't actually blame them. It's almost like blaming their logic, blaming what, it's not them. It's your greed, your lack of vision, your lack of something. It's not you. It's something that you fell into that has caused you to do something. So that's going to be captured at a couple of ayahs from now. I kind of jumped ahead, but we're going to capture back at that point, inshallah. In this, in this instance, to carry the narrative forward, they said to their father, uh, when we were running around, um, and Matthew here definitely right. So they did lose to a wolf. Yeah, they're like, and in this case, a wolf would be Shaytan or the devil, right? Or their own, their own uh, side. Um, but uh, they, like we were, what were we doing? They have a perfect story. This is again, weird. They all say together, we were racing with each other and we left our belongings. Oh, wasn't that convenient? Left our belongings so he couldn't move. And a wolf devoured him. Hmm. But a couple of things that are just weird. Well, Ma'anta, and you wouldn't believe us. This is what I also find interesting. You pause when you say dhibu, and then you say, Wama anta bi mu'minin lana. There's a couple of things going on here. They tell him the story and they say, and you aren't gonna submit to our story. And the way reason I translate that that way is in our in the Quran, anytime you believe willingly, you say mu'minin bihi or or, or bika, we believe in you, we like B is used. When it's lana, it's actually when someone forces you to believe something. Fir'aun and Moses, I'm gonna keep referencing the story of Musa and Pharaoh, but uh, when the magicians bow down uh, 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 and they say that we're bowing down to uh, the Lord of Moses and uh, uh, Harun, uh, Pharaoh tells them, how dare you bow down when I didn't give you permission? And he uses, how dare you believe Lana? How dare you submit to them when I didn't give you permission? Um, the idea of Lana actually found, is, is found there. Be mu'minin Lana. Um, and you won't believe in us. You won't believe or submit to our story. Not Bina. You won't believe in, in us. You won't submit to our story. Even if we had. That's the other thing. Remember I said subtlety in language. They don't say, and we are telling the truth, even if we were telling the truth. Do you hear the difference? You don't believe? And the other part of this, which is weird, is in a moment of crisis, do you ever worry about if someone's going to believe you? No. What do you, what do you worry about? The, the situation at hand. You would be focused on, oh my God, Yusuf, I, how much did he suffer? We feel so bad, blah, blah, blah. No, what is it? Do you believe us? Oh, you wouldn't believe us even like I almost hear this being like they all had a story and one of them's like, he's not believing us. You wouldn't believe us even if we were telling you the truth. Oh. It's one of those because that's how the language is concerned. <laughs> even if we were truthful, you don't believe us to be truthful. Even if we were truthful, which we're not, you wouldn't believe us. It's um, it's funny because it, you know, it's also characteristic of those people who like kind of shed crocodile tears, uh, like like the brothers of Yusuf in this story. Uh, it's like you know how they, they start crying and then they like kind of look up and then see if you're like reacting and they start, just, <laughs> they start crying again. <laughs> Another like kids are also really good at this when there's like legitimate tears when they're hurt or something like that and there's tears of, like when they want something <laughs> and we start giving in a little bit and they're like. <laughs> they go away suddenly and then you turn the story back around no but we won't get it today <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that's that same exact way it's like a manipulative uh story of those manipulative tears that's what i kind of hear this from is like no matter how truthful we are even if we were telling the truth you wouldn't um you, you wouldn't believe us again their father is catching them in the subtleties 
um, of, of what's being said, because that's going to be what's praised in this story again. Don't just look at surface level, look deeper, look, um, look deeper. Um, this is also, I'm going to call it for what it is. Like, I can remember I said, this is a story that's happening in every single home at every, uh, in, in everyone's life. Where, and what I mean by that is hopefully no, no, your no one's siblings are throwing them into a well and saying a wolf ate them. But what I am saying is uh, if the proof of the story is more what you're concerned about than the story itself or what happened, usually there's something weird. Uh, I see this all the time in like uh, uh, when this, I don't know, like I, I think about uh, if someone wants to like scam an insurance company, right? They have the perfect proof. The camera was at a perfect point and it caught this happening. Oh yeah? Huh. And look, I have proof. Like you brought that, you, you tried to prove the story way before I even asked you if it was true or not. Something's wrong. Like the concern shouldn't have been about you believing us. That that shouldn't have been it. I don't, I don't, I don't there seems to be something made up at that point. That's what's being brought up. Um, continues even more in the very next, uh, so Hale said they're bringing uh, with guilt because it's uh, it worked the first time when they asked to take their brother with them. Yeah, that's actually true as well. That's a very good observation, so Hale. Like last time, what did they say? They got their father to drop their guard by saying, don't you even trust us? Don't you even love us? This time they're like, you don't think we're truthful? They're trying it again. And then they pull out the last piece of information. By the way, bring his shirt. And they brought his shirt stained with false blood. Lying blood is actually how it's translated or how, what literally seems to be saying. Um, it's almost like they, you, that was convenient. You had a shirt stained with blood as if there was proof. So something traumatic happened and your first concern was, do we have proof that it happened? Seems like a weird thing to be thinking about when your brother just got eaten by a wolf. You're thinking, let's, let's bring some proof. Let's bring his shirt back. The other idea of like, I sometimes even think about this, like they brought his shirt when I, 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 so I'm more of a nature nut than anything. Like I, I my, my undergrads in bio, I'm like, dude, wolves don't eat people whole. Like how big is a wolf compared to like a 10 year old or like an eight, nine year old? Like a wolf can't eat, an, it's, it's not a whale. It's not an alligator. Like it can't eat you whole. That's not gonna happen. How did the wolf eat someone whole and their shirts remaining? Where did that come from? And all of you couldn't go and chase them down somehow? What did I do, carry it? How can a wolf carry a 10 year old or like a, a kid? It can't, that wouldn't happen. So there's so many parts of this that also don't seem to be completely well thought out. Um, and uh, Yaqub al -Islam, there's actually, this is gonna be in my opinion, some of the most important lessons um, that take place here. Uh, though I, I'm going to read the comments that are on there. Um, there um, that sounds like it should be the opposite. Proof might be the last thing you would be concerned about. Yeah, if something happened to your loved one. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yaqub salam figures out kind of um, what's going on. This is the point that Isra was uh, making. Uh, amrun. He's, his response is bal. I know that it's translated, what is it? No, your souls must have tempted you. The way I translate bal is like, uh-uh, never. Nope. I don't even think bal he even said anything. This was just an expression. It's it's like one of those looks when you're telling someone something and they're just, they don't want it. Bal. lakum anfusukum amran. Your souls must have tempted you to do something evil. Sawalat enticed you is actually how it's translated here, which I think is actually a really good translation. Sawalat is like you falling victim to something. You've become victim of something. And what was that something? Your greed, your envy of your brother, your hatred, you fell victims of it. Or Shaitan got the better of you. Remember that wolf you were talking about? Yeah, there was a wolf. It wasn't an animal though. and you've done something terrible. 
And then he responds, فَسَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Beautiful patience. I have to play this instance in my head. I highly doubt, and also someone who's been in tense family conversations, right? Um, or seen intense family uh, uh, conversations in my own family and also in other families. Um, I don't think what actually took place here is this is exactly what was said. He didn't just say فَسَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ and beautiful patience. He enacted beautiful patience. I actually think that this must have taken hours of conversation of back and forth where he's telling them, how could this happen? And they're not budging. And Allah only captures the highlight of the conversation. So for hours they're talking, can you send someone out? No, it's nighttime. We can't find him. Why don't you guys even want to go? No, but it's useless. And he's asking question after question and they're not giving him anything. And their father just like, okay. You guys must have thought this all out really well because apparently there's nothing I can do. Because it doesn't just end with فَسَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ Allah will help us. Right? It's only Allah that I seek help from. عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ From what you describe. They're like, he's, he's basically saying, my hands are tied. You won't help me. So Allah is the only one who can help me. That's what he's saying. And that's actually a conversation point I want to really build on today is when, when patience is required and what patience looks like in different scenarios, right? I don't see this being a conversation of him just giving up on his son and saying, oh, I'm just going to be patient now. It's he tried everything he could. And he's like, well, you guys seem to have engineered this. Why? Because I would go out and look for him, but now it's nighttime. You won't tell me what the details are. We're not getting anywhere. So all I have left is patience. And the reason I, I, I say that is I want us to think about this in an abstract. And I want you to actually uh, think about the scenario of patience and what's an appropriate use of patience and what's an, a not an appropriate use of patience. Because what Sabr and Jamiran also tells me is beautiful patience. There's such thing as ugly patience. There's Sabr and Khabithun, ugly patience. And I want us to think about that, all right? Um, let's say that uh, I'm on a plane and someone bumps into me accidentally. Right? They're not six feet apart, no, I'm kidding. But they, they bump into me accidentally. Uh, and um, in that moment, if I'm patient, is that beautiful or ugly patience? What do you guys think? That would be beautiful patience. That would be beautiful patience. I agree. And the reason is because like, this is just a, my own character is being tried here. And inshallah, if I don't say anything, like their day is better and my day is better as a result. Because if I get angry right now, like they're going to get mad. I'm going to get mad. Nothing's going to be solved. So that's beautiful patience. I'm going to give another example. Let's say um, my wife and I used to travel a lot. Um, we don't anymore because no one travels anymore. But uh, <laughs> um, let's say we're traveling and I, my, my wife's actually the best travel companion ever. So this doesn't actually apply. This is a complete hypothetical. But let's just say that every time we travel, like she does something that like it puts me in pain. That like maybe when, if she falls asleep on my arm, my arm is numb every time and I can't use it for the next day. Like it's super sore or something. Um, me being patient then, is that beautiful patience or is that ugly patience? Well, the way I presented it makes it seem like it's ugly patience, right? But why is it ugly patience? Let me put it this way. Me being patient in that moment, is it going to lead to further resentment? Yeah, I'm going to interact with my, I'm going to go traveling hopefully with her many times, right? And I'm going to be, I'm going to not like the idea of traveling with her every single time. And it's going to make our relationship worse. So what did that patience actually accomplish? Resentment. That's not a good patience. You know what would be the better act in that moment would be Hey, by the way, please stop doing this. I want to love traveling with you. This is the one thing that annoys me while we travel so that our future can then be awesome travels all the time. Why does he say, Fasabrun Jamilun? Talking with you is making the situation worse. Continuing this conversation is going to make me not appreciate you and you guys not appreciate me. So now, Fasabrun Jamilun. Wallahu musta'an. Allah can only help from what you describe. You don't fall for beautiful patience when you can do something about it. At that point, that becomes actually a problematic patience. And the other idea, 
of you don't act when it's going to make the situation worse. That time, beautiful patience is doing nothing. Do you guys see and hear the distinction between these two things? This also takes place in family matters sometimes, where certain times things should be brought up because if they're not, it leads to resentment. If the situation is just going to keep getting worse, so talk about it. Other times, if you keep talking about it, it's going to get worse. That is what excuses beautiful patience. That's the situation he found himself in. I'm hoping that this makes a little bit of sense. Sorry, I've just been thinking about this all day. <laughs> this applies to every, any part of life. It's just, it, you, it's, it's so clean, even though life is not black and white, but it's so cleanly presented where you pick the thing that provides the most benefit, so to speak, right? Um, sometimes it like, you, it becomes, well, is it better for me to, like whatever harbors the least amount of negativity basically, right? How else would you, and that, and that makes sense because in Islam, like that's what we're supposed to embrace, right? We're not supposed to hold on to negativity. When we forgive someone as opposed to expecting justice, we earn so much reward for that. That doesn't, not to negate the idea of justice, right? But there is a specific reward that comes with forgiveness. So if we're supposed to embody that and apply it to every part of our life, it should apply to patience as well. And this actually helped solve a problem I was having. So Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, that, that's good to hear. I saw a question that Sada asked in the chat. And so people can be innocent looking and come with proofs and they can still be liars. So how do we differentiate? Do we believe out of empathy and act on it or keep our distance? That's a very, very, very good question, Sada. I don't actually have an answer. Um, other than what this surah seems to suggest is um, we need to do our due diligence and use emotional and social intelligence to actually arrive at answers rather than just quote unquote engineered proofs and feelings. Um, where there's this idea of, that's why in our tradition, the idea of witness is so important and it actually supersedes, and a witness isn't just anyone, you look at their whole track record and their history. Though that can be engineered as well, that's harder to engineer than a plot. Does that help? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so that's where beautiful patience to me, it's, it, it's, it's an unfortunately a very misunderstood concept. And I, I want us to really realize that it's emphasized a lot in this surah and it's emphasized in other places in the Quran as well for Sabr and Jameel. It doesn't always mean to be quiet. There's some, sometimes beautiful patience means having the courage to say something that's not gonna lead to further resentment. That's also beautiful patience. Beautiful patience is, <laughs> there's many examples of this I can give, right? Um, my, my daughter, I, I, I use her example all the time because she's, just my, my go-to example person for now. Um, there are many things as a four-year-old that for her to do takes way longer than for me to do. That like, well, I'll tell her to help with the laundry or hold something or bring two pieces of clothes upstairs, right? And as she's bringing them, <laughs> she drops one of them. So I have to go back down and pick it up anyway. So it takes us both longer to do something than it takes for me to do something individually. I would say in this case, beautiful patience means no, still letting her do it. Why? Because if I do this enough times first, it builds closeness between us. And eventually it gets to the point where I'm going to be happy to be around her all the time. That's actually beautiful patience. What's not beautiful patience is to take away her autonomy. Like it applies in almost every kind of scenario. Beautiful patience of, do I bring it up to someone or do I not bring it up to someone? Well, what's your relationship to them? Because if your relationship is to the point where you're going to see them again and your relationship is going to improve because you were honest with each other, you tell them. If it's not, you're, you don't have the right to say it. You bring it up, you need beautiful patience. Why? Because you're not the right person to bring it up. Beautiful patience has a, applications all throughout. And we need to appreciate that there is, if there is beautiful patience, there's ugly patience. And we don't want to fall for ugly patience. Make sense? Uh, Chapman, really quick question, actually. So when it says he responded, is he responding to the brothers or is he kind of consoling himself after they said, oh, you don't believe us? So is he telling himself, no, 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 you know, like, I don't, I don't, I don't believe what you're saying. Cause I mean, I would imagine as a parent, he's having some kind of internalized conflict here because of the emotional manipulation he's facing, but also because of the truth. 
It's probably both. I'm inclined to think that when it stops at Amran, that's one statement. And then Fasabrun Jamilun is another statement. Wallahu Musta'anu ala ma tasifun is another statement. So Okay, the, yeah, that's that's what I thought too, but then the quotation marks kind of threw me off. Yeah. Um, that's why the recitation itself also has in it um, meaning. The way I see it is even when you're talking to someone, there's certain times like you direct a conversation and then you even talk to yourself. Like, yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I tend to do this all the time where I'll, I'll, I'll say something like, wait, that wasn't that day. Okay. And then you, you jump back in. I almost see this as one of those situations. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was asking. That's what I thought. All right. Just like a little bit. Wait, yeah. Any other um, comments on, and I know we're at seven o'clock already. If we can go for 10 or 15 more minutes, I want to still get to the ayat that we were planning on getting to two more today. I have a grammar comment. Everything up until this point is actually a verb, so it's limited to time. And then suddenly you get like Fasabrun Jamilun, which is a full sentence, a full sentence, and it's all nouns. And that's really cool. It, I think that's really cool because all of a sudden you're not time bound, and patience is always going to be beautiful. Not not always, but as in Fasabrun Jamilun is always Fasabrun Jamilun. That's, that's actually really cool. I, I, I like the idea that it's, it's, a, it's a noun in that way. Huh. I hadn't thought about that either. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Look, look at how much grammar pays off. And yes, my apologies. I need for a little bit of Sabrun Jamil in here. <laughs> As this little one joined us. Um, then Allah SWT continues. وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ فَأَرَسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهُ and there came some travelers and they sent their water boy out who let his bucket down into the well. Again, remember every detail is, has meaning in with it, right? And why would Allah say that there came a caravan and they sent their water boy who put the bucket into the well? Um, I'm gonna go just, I'm gonna speed through this, but think about it this way. Uh, do you think the water boy owns the caravan? No, right? Why would Allah capture that detail? Well, it seems to be, one is that's how, capturing how remote they sent them to, that random caravan, when it's looking for water, they don't know all the spots. So they find this one obscure well saying how obscure the water uh, well already is. So that's one reason this ghayab with the jub that they found is really obscure. Second reason I would say is, um, what, was it a rich person or a poor person that found it? There was actually a poor person. Because I highly doubt the guy who owns the caravan, like the original Amazon.com, right? <laughs> Before we had, like, there, there was their delivery system. What do you these caravans that go from place to place to place? They pick up stuff and they drop it off uh, back in the day. Um, I remember that one of my teachers said um, orig the original Amazon actually used to travel through the Amazon uh, to, get, uh, to get things. Um, so uh, as you... Um, so as uh, uh, it's going, Allah captures the detail of they sent their water boy. Why? This, this poor person found them. And that's what seems to put forward the next comment that he makes. He's like, oh my gosh, what an amazing find. Here's a boy. If he, he's the reason he thinks this is awesome, and this is actually a really dark point of this whole conversation. When he sees a boy, the first thing you are supposed to say is not, this is good for me. What should it be? Oh my gosh, who put a boy here? That should be the response. But he's happy for himself. Yeah, Bushra is an expression of like, I struck gold. It's a boy. Why is that so problematic? Because he sees a person and he thinks money signs. That's problematic. Um, I think we'll open up with this next time too, but this is the problem of a hyper-materialistic society that when they look at a person, they don't see a person who has unique capability and ability and like empathize with them and what must they be feeling? How scared must he have been? They think what? This is the best, this is the best thing that's happened to me today. Why? Because I can sell him. And how's that captured? Wa asarruhu. And they secretly took him. And what's that? Wallahu alimun bima And Allah is knowing what they did. They took him as merchandise. 
they they took him just like and the way they treat it is this isn't if they kept him when they went with him no 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 they hid him they put him in a bag is what's being captured here they put him in a bag um uh, as merchandise as just a means of making money and allah knows what they did what's they this is a comment on slavery where they don't see when they see a young person they don't see a young person full of potential they see a means of making money um and this should make us think we're supposed to do the opposite of these people that when we see a young person especially a young person in need our first response should not be how can i benefit from it i was but unfortunately that seems that's sometimes people's responses even like major companies do this that like their primary concern for even providing human uh, rights is we're going to look good in the eyes of people. Of like when you think about it, like a company hired what? Uh, uh, HR department, why? To protect themselves from lawsuits. Is it to make the environment better for people? No, unfortunately, it's usually not. What is it? We're getting too many lawsuits and they're getting expensive. So let's give our uh, workers just basic enough training so that they're not... Um, uh, they're not just, um, uh, we're not going to lose money on it. Like that's unfortunately what hyper-materialism um, tends to do. And yes, I know my mic is really great. Okay. Um, little man wants to run around. Uh, so that's, that's part of where this is uh, uh, going to. And the commentary that's really to be made here is uh, the, the realities and the evils of um, kind of slavery and we can have an even much more in-depth conversation of when you think about what was the major um, driving force behind slavery in any point in history, it was economics, right? What's the major, I know this seems weird me talking about slavery while I'm holding a little, <laughs> little guy right here, um, but uh, what's, the, I think, uh, what's the major reason why slavery exists today even? Like we like to sometimes think slavery was a thing of the past. But what we've done is we've traded uh, um, uh, black slaves for Chinese slaves, for people in sweatshops, right? That you're still the same thing, people who work for barely anything. And what do they work for at the end of the day? Do we treat them as people? No, they're a means for us to get better products. They're a means for us to show off. It might not be, we might not show people off anymore of like we own them, we, we own the things that they make. That's still slavery. That's still the exact same thing that led to what this terrible thing happening to Yusuf alayhi salam. And we're going to see in the next couple of um, uh, ayats that it's going to get into, into, like he was passed from home to home, from place to place. And why was he passed from place to place? Because what did people see him as? For their own benefit. What can we benefit from him? When, and I, I go back to this, when who was Yusuf alayhi salam at the end of the day? He was Allah's uh, mechanism for saving an entire nation. He was Allah's mechanism for saving an entire nation. He was a noble prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when people looked at him, they're like, oh, he's in the way of us benefiting. Like that's what the brothers did. The other guys, he's a means for our benefit. What money? So they, they stole him. Um, and uh, uh, Allah even captures Allah, uh, uh, um, Allah knows what they did. There seems to be almost a suggestion that Yusuf suffered a lot in this trip. You can just imagine people who treated him as a slave, what else they maybe did to him. There's some creative commentary that gets into this. This is actually putting forward that he might have been uh, abused by them. He might have been physically abused. He might have been abused in worse ways, but Allah knows what they did. It's almost like it faded to black when you focus on like a really evil character. Mm -hmm. um, when you and if we want to delve more into details, why would it Allah say that they hid him? The people of the caravan, you know what they decided? They're like, do you think they're going to report it to their boss that they found a little boy, uh, like a, a, um, a, a, a slave to sell? No, they kept it for themselves. Meaning, not the best treatment. He didn't get sold into like the elite market. What did he get sold into? the types of markets that these people who is, whose job is being the water boy of a caravan. That's where Yusuf al was sold into. Like it's a, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty dark type of place. And the last ayah that we're going to focus on for today is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ They were, and they sold him 
for a measly price, Bahsin, just like a throwaway price. And they did it quickly too. Why? Um, Allah SWT captures that in the, in the very next part. Um, uh, and they tried to get rid of him for just a few pieces of silver. They just wanted to get rid of him. Why? Because he's he's hot. The 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 the, the term we can use is um, he's hot merchandise. He's stolen. When someone is stolen, it's not legitimate. You don't have the papers for him. So what? Whatever. Just pay me whatever you can. Um, so that's one side. I know you're. I'm. I'm getting super distracted by you. Yeah, you. Um, that he he was. They sold him for just a little bit, and they sold him uh, really quickly. Why? Because one is they didn't know what he was worth. Who is he at the end of the day? He's a prophet. Can you guys hear me through this? Through the growls. Yes, we can. We're in. We're in. We're getting the benefit from both. <laughs> Okay, so he, he was sold for just a measly price. One, because um, they wanted to get rid of him as quickly as possible. And the other is they don't actually realize what they have. So this is the other idea of anyone who does this to people. This isn't just a comment about Yusuf al Islam. This is also a comment about anyone who treats people like slave labor. Anyone who treats people as a means of just money all the time. That what are they doing? They're, sell you're, they're selling people way too short that if if all you see when you look at a, a a new group of people coming in right instead of seeing like this is an amazing blessing from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i get to interact with all of these people and my life is going to become so enriched and they're going to do so much good on this earth instead of doing that what do you think how much money can i make off of them that's our mindset what have we done sold them for just a few things without knowing what they were actually worth they just want us to get rid of them. It's a question that we have to ask ourselves when we look at people, even in business transactions, right? Uh, do we want to be people who just like see others as a means of profit, quote unquote? Or is it like, no, it's, a, it's an interaction that's supposed to take place. You value someone for the human characteristics they bring to the table. Um, any comments on the last two verses? I know I just kind of rushed through them. There's a lot more that we can talk about. And inshallah, we'll probably open up with this next week as well. I have kind of an example of how this is presented in real life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. One of I, I'm in the business school and one of the requirements is for us to take an ethics course. And I remember the first day of class, the, prof the professor presented us with a scenario where he gave us a bunch of financial statements and he said, if you were to enter a deal with this company, would you do it? Like, do you have the option to do that? And everybody looked at the numbers and we looked at the paperwork and they said, yeah, this looks good. You yield a profit at the end of it by this percentage. Go for it. And maybe 15, 20 minutes into the lecture, he said, not a single one of you asked me what this company does. Yeah. And then we said, okay, what does the company do? And he said, oh, they're an advertisement company. And he said, okay. And then nobody asked, what do they advertise? And it was just this constant thing of him showing us, you guys don't ask the questions. You guys were just looking to get the most profit. And that's kind of how the education system is centered because really that company advertises pornography. And none of us knew that because we didn't ask we were concerned with the numbers. And then we went into, well, is this ethical or not ethical? And some people argued it was, some people argued it wasn't. And the basis of that was we came to the conclusion, of course, that it's unethical because society pays the debt of pornography, right? The pornography industry is not paying that debt, the detriment to relationships, divorce, mental health, Society pays the debt of that, which is what makes it unethical. But none of us thought about it that deeply because we spent so much of our time trying to figure out, well, this is profitable, so we should do it. Wow. It took us two hours to come to that conclusion. And we're a bunch of 20-something-year-olds more than halfway through our undergraduate career. And not a single one of us asked 
what does this company do? Like imagine how much damage we would have done if this was an actual scenario. This should open up so many lines of thinking for all of us. And I even, so I, I, I've worked in higher education now for like nine years, something like that. And one of the things that uh, I think about quite regularly is I remember being in a meeting in which uh, promotional materials were being put forward and uh, they used the image of a student of color. And I remember looking at it and being like, I knew some of the background of what was going on. I was like, this, like I was actually, part of me was uh, happy. I'm like, okay, good. Like representation, diversity and all that type of stuff. But then on the other side, I'm like, uh, no, I was just working with a student who like talks about the racist um, policies of this institution all the time. And I'm like, her face is going to be used to promote this idea that this school accepts people of all things. Do you see how contradictory that was? I was like, her face is going to be tokenized for what? For trying to get other the school to make more money, trying to get more people enrolled in this institution. This is not Rutgers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that out there um, but like I was like this is so backwards in so many different ways I'm like at the end of the day her face was being used to make more money like in the claim for diversity like has nothing to do with actually expanding the kind of um, what this place has to offer or anything like that it just it felt so weird and dirty and it really came down to that question of can you put a price on a human life Allah says no that's what the story, that's what a lot of comments with this ayah. There's no price on a human life. These people put one and do, do each of us. I, I actually have a couple of thoughts um, on that scenario. Yes, well, here, I, I yes, um, yeah, I think I think that's that's an interesting view. And and Isra, I think that was was that a business school class or was that like a, just a general class you were taking around like a business concept? No, yeah, it was business ethics. It's one of the requirements. It's you either take okay. business law or business ethics, right? So I chose ethics. Yeah, yeah I'm familiar with that class. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's, that's one of the things that um, like in, in today's business world, there's a lot of conversations happening about ethics. There's a lot of conversations happening about um, you know, the, the whole, uh, you, you know, how do we look at these core social issues and, and either use them to our advantage or um, particularly be authentic and genuine about it, right? And um, I, I think it comes down to, from your perspective of, as a business school student, like, you know, ask, answering your question of why didn't we know, why do we know that this, comp this company had this particular motive? Um, I think it, it comes down to how do we think critically about, um, you know, our education? How do we not, not, sorry, not think critically about our education, but think critically about problem scenarios, right? Um, how do we assess different situations from a, from a different lens? And I think that comes down to practicing it, right? Um, one of the things that I, I, I do personally when I'm looking at like a business model or I'm trying to dissect like the ethical use case of it. And I actually had a conversation with Chaplain Kessler this previous summer um, about like Islamic finance and, and um, about the, the impacts of like ethical trade-offs versus is this halal versus haram? Do I want to be a part of it? Do I want to contribute to it? Um, and, and ultimately, I think it comes down to how do you develop like a, a sense of, I guess, depth um, that you have to practice yourself, right? Of like, what lens do I want to look at, you know, this particular subject from, or um, like, what's the long-term impact that I'm going to have if I contribute to this, right? Or what are some of the factors that I have to think about? Um, and, and that's what helps you kind of put things into perspective and motion. Um, but it takes time. And, and I think like, you have to figure out, like, it, it's, it's hard, it's hard to answer because it's like, you don't, you don't know what track you can take, but I think, the, the thing is, is, you have to be self-aware of, let's just not look at the, the point blank. Let's figure out how to, you know, develop a, a good depth perception, I would say, of like this business problem or what's, 
what this company's brand is, but then let's question like the, they call it the five whys, right? Like why, why are they putting that image or that branding uh, in the first place? Like, why is the company saying this particular thing? Right. Um, and the moment you start asking those five whys, you get deeper and deeper into realizing, oh, this is something that a lot of other companies do, or this is something how people care about or look at, at this in a very traditional sense. And you got, you, you kind of tear tear away those perceptions. I think it just takes time, but it's important to consider that. Yeah, no matter, I think you I think you bring up a, a solid point of, there's one thing of looking at the problem and be like, I never want to be a part of it anymore. And there's another of that deeply understanding. And that's actually what this surah will really get into when we're talking about Yusuf Islam. He is in the beginning of this surah going to be the victim of all of the annoying situations. Terrible sibling rivalry, uh, people seeing other people as just a means of money, so being sold into slavery, people's desires getting him into prison, right? But he's gonna see he's gonna see all manner of like he's gonna be the victim of all manners of abuse. But then what do we see him do? Does he say, I will never engage with people again? No, he actually takes a position to do something about all of it. Right? So yeah. just because it's there doesn't mean you don't get involved. You actually then understand the systemic situation that led to it and start, de- when you are in a position of power, once you have the education to understand it completely, dismantle it piece by piece over the parts that are problematic, but keep, of course, the parts that are not. So again, this sort of becomes the case study of just what you're describing. Of This isn't the point to say, I will never engage with it ever again. It's more of a understand where it's coming from, understand the human level, the people interaction level, family level, societal level, even if that means understanding means being affected by them in order to reverse it. And that's what Yusuf Aysam is really credited for. What does he do? He becomes a righteous ruler at the end of it. So it's not leave these people, punish them. No, it's not it. Understand that they were, they were at the end of the day, they fell into this as well. You're going to be a means of getting them out. So we'll, we'll study that, inshallah. I know it's already been seven uh, past 7.20. Um, uh, if anyone has any final concluding comments, we'll take them. If not, uh, um, we'll, we'll conclude, inshallah, and continue next week. Next week, we're going to go ayat 20 through... Let me just make sure I ch- uh, checked this properly. We'll, yeah, we'll try to go until ayat 24 or 25 next week, inshallah. So we'll try five to six ayat a week. Um, and... Uh, um, go on from there. Any concluding remarks from anyone? If not, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those that we don't treat human beings like dollar signs, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that when we see a problem in front of us, we recognize the narrative that it came from, that we're able to pick up a false narrative when it's in front of us so that we're not just at the whims of other people's feelings, whether they be used for good or harm, but we're actually able to empower those with appropriate stories and those that are trying to do good in this world and reduce the harm for those that are uh, trying to do harm in this world. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand what sabrun jamilun, beautiful patience actually is, that it's a patience that leads to further good, not a patient that a patience that leads to further resentment and to have the wisdom of Yaqub alayhi salam, that when we find ourselves in a situation where we can't do anything, we don't make the situation worse. We hold ourselves back. But we're, when we're in a situation where we can do something about it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have the uh, courage to act in an appropriate manner as well. I mean, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.